songs of praise. resurrection. Amen? Amen. Hey, I don't have too many announcements with you. Obviously, I see a lot of bright, smiling faces. If you are new here, you're visiting for the first time or for the third time, we really want to get you connected, want to hear from you, get to know you a little bit. We do have those seat backs in front of you. There's uh, visitor cards. There's also a communication get plugged in wall we have out in the lobby. We would love for you to check it out, see all the different ministries that we do around here and uh, get you plugged in serving somewhere or getting fellowship somewhere or having relationship with other believers somewhere, right? So, hey, we're going to take the next couple minutes. I'm glad you guys are all standing because most of you sit down and want to do this. So uh, go ahead and take a few minutes just to greet each other around you, get to know somebody new, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll get things started after that.
Wow, wow, wow. We love seeing that. Thank you guys so much for, for taking the time to fellowship with one another. Uh, we have a real special guest with you guys this morning. Uh, one of our very own, Michael Moore. Um, I'm going to bring him out real quick. And he has a, something a little special to share with all of you. Uh, feel free to have a seat. Yeah. Okay, I got to read this. <laughs> oh, it's good to be back. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> okay, bear with me here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Moore. This is my wife, Debbie Moore. And uh, recently I had an accident. <laughs> uh, December 11th of 2021, I broke 10 ribs, cracked my skull, shattered my T11 vertebrae and damaged my spinal cord. Uh, that was ouch, that was a big ouch. But long story short, um, after they flew me to Colorado Springs, I ended up at Craig Hospital in Denver in January where I learned um, how to live again. Uh, those first couple of months, they were really dark for me mentally. I was in a, I was in a bad, bad, mental place and then Debbie could just continually reminded me and was sharing with me of you guys of the church body there you've got people praying for you you've got people helping you you've got a whole community of family friends that are praying and helping and that kind of started getting me out of the funk uh, then I listened to a pastor that uh, on my phone that talked about David and Goliath, and we're all f really familiar with David and Goliath, but he talked about how David had to have faith in God to provide a victory over Goliath. And so he had to face Goliath. He had to get up in front of Goliath and face him. And so that's what he did. He, he got up in front, and he... You know, they, they stack the armor on him and they put all this junk and he's like, you idiots, get this off, you dummies. I'm going to face him like I faced the lion, like I faced the bear. And he faced Goliath and God provided five stones. He didn't have those stones uh, when he, he didn't even know he, what he would do, but there they were. And so when David faced his Goliath, God provided. And that really gave me the strength to say, you know what? I got to face my Goliath. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I got to do it. And I got to have faith in God that this is going to happen. <laughs> so I, I said, I'm going to do this. And God provided five stones. You guys, through prayer, through love, through uh, encouragement and assisting. <laughs> yeah, I lost my place. <sighs> and encouragement, he provided you guys and that gave me the five stones to say, I can face him. And some people look at this and they look at that as a disability, but I look at it as a wonderful opportunity to face my Goliath because I got your five stones. And I can't thank you guys ever enough for I felt those prayers, man. I felt the love and I felt the encouragement. And sometimes when I would pray for people back in the day, I was wondering, am my prayers really doing something? Is my help really helping those people? And I want you guys to know it did for me. So you can keep doing it, that'll be okay. <laughs> Don't mind. <laughs> but the biggest thing is uh, I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.
Well, folks, happy Easter. He is risen! Amen. Let's play that video, Sherry.
Show me to 
victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death is swallowed up in victory.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved.
Right here. This is where Jesus was kneeling when they uh, came and grabbed him. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I came in from this direction with my sword drawn and I cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. 
<laughs> reacted exactly the way Jesus told us not to. And Jesus, he picks up that man's ear. And he puts it right on his head. Like it always been there. But that's what he did. Jesus was always fixing people's messes. <laughs> you know, um, I said I didn't know him that night. Three times. Three times. I denied my friend. He told me I was gonna do it before I even did it. And like an idiot, I argued with him. <laughs> but he was right. He's always right. He told us he was going to die before he died. But you know what he did? You know what he did when he came back to life? <laughs> that morning when he came back to life, he gave me the opportunity to tell him I loved him. greatest regret but that's how he does it when it settles here it changes here and that turns the past upside down it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what happened that night because of what happened that morning because he beat death. Death. He is alive. <laughs> alive! Morning is our joy. Thank you so much for being here this morning and not just saying that, we are delighted that you've chosen to be a part of the family. We're here to celebrate, we are here to remember, we are here to be challenged both by the music, the videos and God's word and we hope that is exactly what will happen. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this special day. Without the resurrection, Paul reminds us that we out of all men would be most to be pitied. But we are not to be pitied because we have a hope that is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is sure, it is guaranteed. And I pray this morning that as we spend time in your word talking about it, that the hearts of everyone here would be encouraged and would be blessed. Lord, for those that maybe are not real sure of their relationship with you, they, they, they know all about it, they know the story, they've been associated with it for so many years, but, but Lord, for them it's not really a personal thing. I pray this morning would be the morning when it becomes very personal. And I pray that your spirit would have free course to work in our hearts to accomplish your will. And we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to Luke this morning to look at Luke's account of the resurrection. Luke chapter 24. And you can follow along as we read just these first 12 verses. 
But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And they were frightened, and they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanne and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. You know, from this account, I am reminded that there are so many different responses to the resurrection. If we were to consider even just three of the many different responses. We would maybe start with the, with the far left, the far extreme on one side. And we would say for those who are just plain unbelievers, they do not believe that this is God's word. They do not believe that what is said in this book actually happened. To them, the resurrection is it's just a fairy tale. It's not, you know, it's not worth much more than the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. It is a story that we tell at a certain time of year to make us feel good with lots of smiles and laughter and fun events and, and uh, Easter eggs. And that's just about it. And you go to bed that night with a stomach ache if you had too much to eat. There's also another group. And this is a group that we'll just call the religious so many people in this group, they kind of grew up around the church. They, they probably were almost always in church come Easter or maybe Christmas. Maybe their parents were big time church people. But as so many have said, well, I just never really got into it as much as my mom and dad did, right? I just never really bought in quite as much as they did. You know, to them, this is a great story. This is a, this is a fun day. They love to be a part of what's going on here. They love the singing. They love the cheering. They love the videos. They just love the, the, the goodness that you feel when the underdog wins and, you know, and, and death is defeated and love comes out on top. But for them, it's, it's missing something. It's missing a personal connection. You know, for them, it's a lot like going to your favorite sporting event. You know, the excitement, the anticipation is almost electric in the air. And you go in the stadium and you're a part of this huge crowd and you're screaming and yelling and you're jumping up and down and you're high-fiving. And yet when it's all said and done and you're walking out of the stadium, you can turn to the friends you went with and you can say, man, that was a great game. This was a great experience. But you go home largely the same way you came. And really, the event was not worth much more to you than just the kind of the entertainment value. And at least in some ways, that's what Easter is to so many folks. It's a great story, and this is a great day. And we're all looking forward to great food and time with family and friends. And when it's all said and done, we'll be able to lay our head on the pillow tonight and go, man, it was a good day. It was a great day. I love Easter, but our life really is not changed because of it. And then if you go to the other extreme on the other side, you have what I'm just calling this morning the the Christ followers, right? They are the ones that, that did take it all real seriously. They not only believe the story, but they, they just did so much more. They, you know, they, uh, they accepted it. They confessed it. They received it. They applied it. They loved to talk about it. When it comes to the story of the resurrection, they see themselves in it. Even as you heard in the words of the song, they, they heard their own voice rejecting and mocking Christ. They saw their own hands 
pounding those spikes through the wrist of Jesus. They saw their guilt. They understood that he hung there because of them. It's a very personal thing to them. And because of that, their life has been changed. They went home one day much different than they came because they understood what the resurrection was really all about. You know, which kind of leads us to that question. So why, why is the resurrection so important? Or even before the resurrection, why did Jesus have to die? Why did God come up with that plan? Have you ever wondered about that? Eternity passed, you have the three members of the Trinity sitting around and, and uh, laying out what's going to happen in the future. And with perfect wisdom and perfect insight and perfect creativity, not hampered in any way, far beyond our ability to understand, they dreamed up a plan. And friends, this is it. You know, it's so important for us to understand that their plan was not devised because it would be the easiest way for Jesus to get in and get out. Oh, there's so many other ways that he could have accomplished what needed to be accomplished. I mean, different prophecies could have been given. It would have been a lot easier. But that was never the determining factor in the plan that was dreamed up. In fact, I've got to take you back to Isaiah 53 to remind you and remind me of this plan. I'm just going to highlight some of the verses. We've kind of thought about them this last Friday for Good Friday. But in 53, 4, it said, surely he is born. And don't miss all of these personal connections, our griefs. And he's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the, the punishment, the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We were the ones that needed healing. All we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. The iniquity, the transgressions, the shortcomings, the failures, the sin of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Why? He was not there for himself. He could have easily said, wait a minute, I am not guilty. I have not done any of the things that you charged me with. But he was not there for himself he was there for us and let me tell you something you and I are guilty of everything that he was charged with and there's no way that he could open his mouth and say they're not guilty either because we are guilty we stand guilty we are condemned and so in love and grace and mercy he just stood there and he took it all because of our sin. They made his grave with the wicked, with, rich, uh, with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, nothing wrong. He was not guilty of anything personally. There was no deceit in his mouth, nothing that was not true, nothing that was not pure, nothing that was not honest. He was completely and totally above reproach in every way. And yet there he stood condemned because of your sin and mine. And now we hear about the plan, the will of God. Yet it was the will of the Lord, Yahweh, to crush him. This was the plan from the beginning. It was to crush Jesus so that his blood would flow, so that it could be applied to our sin, to wash it away. And without the shedding of blood, we're told there's no forgiveness. There's no removal of sin. And so God's plan from the beginning was to crush Jesus. He goes on. He has put him to grief. It was God's plan to put Jesus to grief. 
and oh, did he suffer. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, it was God's plan to crush Jesus as an offering for the guilt of mankind. Your guilt and mine, it was his plan. And he says, when he does that, he shall see his offspring. He did not stay dead. He accomplished what he went to accomplish. He was crushed. He was made an offering. But God the Father says, but don't worry. He will be there to see his offspring. He, God, shall prolong his days. How about for eternity future? That's a pretty good prolonging of days and for all of eternity it says the will of the Lord of Yahweh this plan will prosper because of Jesus willingness to go to the cross not just okay that's enough it'll take care of the deal it's the least amount no no not only will God's plan be accomplished not only will it be successful but it will flourish and we might not really understand much of that now but when we Stand in his presence for eternity. We will see what it means to prosper. We will see and understand what it means that when God does something, boy, he does it really, really well. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see, God shall see, and be satisfied. The demands of the law were met. The blood of Christ that was shed as a result of his crushing in this offering, in this sacrifice, was sufficient to absolutely cover every single one of your sins. And we'll make that just as personal as it can possibly be. Even if nobody else was ever alive on this earth, your sin was such that It took the blood of Jesus Christ, shed the way it was shed, freely offered the way it was offered in order to cover your sin. And I say that for you, and I say that for the person sitting next to you, and the person sitting next to them, and the person standing up here. He saw it, and it was enough to satisfy those demands of a holy, righteous God. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And if you want to take many out of there and put your name in there, again, it makes it more meaningful. Because of what Jesus Christ did, he was able to make John to be accounted righteous. And oh, if you just knew John a little bit better, you would know what a stretch that is. It was enough to make Marlene righteous. And my children, Annie and Johnny and Kyle. And the grandchildren that have come from them as well. It was enough. It was sufficient to be able to make them righteous who were not righteous before. And it says that he, Jesus, shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death. And was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many. And he's there making intercession. For all of us who are the transgressors. This was God's plan. And he didn't design it. He didn't devise it because it would be the easiest for Jesus. We might argue that it was absolutely the most difficult that it could possibly be. But we will say this, as best as we can understand with our puny little brains. It was the plan that would best reflect the depth and the wonder of his love for you and for me. You know, you hang around with yourself quite a bit during the course of the day. You get tired of yourself. And sometimes we get tired of you too, right? As you get tired of us. And yet he loves you so much. 
that he said, let's not make this easy. But let's make it so absolutely difficult that nobody will ever, ever wonder how much I love them. That I'm willing to go through what I went through in order to secure for them the opportunity to be with me forever. It was the plan that is, again, as best as we can understand, would most reflect the glory and the majesty and the wonder and the creativity of Almighty God. And for all of eternity forward, you and I who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ will have the privilege to sing, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. And to wonder at his goodness and to wonder at his grace and his mercy, knowing who we were and what we offered, which was nothing. That's the plan. And so the resurrection was critical in this plan, not only because it, it, it proved that God could keep his word, not only because through the resurrection, Satan was dealt that, that knockout punch that ultimately would consign him to the lake of fire. Not only was it necessary for, for God to remove the stinger from death, but it was, and this is what means so much to us this morning, it was absolutely essential in order to approve or to prove that the death of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for our sins was, it was accepted. Right? When Jesus said it's finished, God said, great job, come on home. And you can sit here right next to me. It was adequate. It was enough to cover not only your sin and mine, but the sin of the whole world, of all of human history. Boy, not only was it enough, but it was effective. It set out to accomplish what it set out to accomplish. You know, I've often wondered that um, the God the Father at that moment in time, just like he did at the baptism, I just wonder sometimes why he didn't shout for the world to hear, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. Just think about it. He accomplished the sacrifice for our sins. He carried out his father's will perfectly and completely. He opened the door for all who would believe to come spend eternity with him and, and come into the very presence of God. And he made a way when there was no other way for us to be able to be together. And he did it without opening his mouth and he did it without complaining and he did it without, other than that garden time when he just said, Father, if there's any other way to do this, can we talk about that? And please understand, it wasn't because of the suffering, it wasn't because of the pain, it wasn't because of the death. I believe it was because for the first time in his eternal existence, he was going to experience what it felt like to not be intimately connected with his father. During those hours on the cross, the hours of darkness, what, from 12 to 3, when God the Father rained down upon him all of his righteous wrath that Romans 1 is saying is being revealed against the sin and the wickedness of mankind, and Jesus just hung there and bore it. We again, with our puny brains, trying to just understand this, the Father had to have turned away. The Father had to have somehow put space between him, perfect, holy righteousness and holiness and his son who was now being literally made sin for us. And though it might not seem like a long time for you and for me, to Jesus maybe it felt like an eternity. So much so was at the end of that time when he cried out, my God, my God. He didn't say, Daddy, where are you? He said, my God, judicially, I know what you're doing. I know what you have to do, but why have you abandoned me? 
And I believe that that fellowship was then restored. And maybe the angels that were ministering to them, maybe even his, his own father whispered in his ear, good job, son, good job. You can come home now. You've done everything that we agreed you would do. You've done it perfectly. You've done it flawlessly. Good job. So the resurrection is a huge, huge deal. And this morning as we close, I just want to be sure that all of you understand that that probably every one of you can find yourself in one of those three categories that we started out with. And if you are a Christ follower and if you understand that all of this was for you and it was because of you and that Jesus didn't just die for you, he died in your place. And it breaks your heart and it brings tears to you, your eyes and, and you find yourself you know, just on your face thanking him. And you feel that personal connection that the Holy Spirit brings when he indwells us. And I just hope this morning has encouraged you. Feed that. Feed that. Spend time in the word. Listen for the Spirit's voice. Grow in your understanding of who he is and what he's done for you and what it means for your life. If you find yourself in that, that middle group where maybe you've been around church your whole life, but it still doesn't feel very personal. You can't remember if you've ever cried over your sin. You don't even know for sure if if you're bad enough that you need to ask for forgiveness because you can surely find a few hundred million people that are a lot worse than you are, right? If you're on the outside looking in, then I want you to understand that the resurrection is really of no more value to you than it is to the one who says, I just don't believe that it ever really happened. Because it's not personal for you. You've not made it yours. Jesus died in order to pay your debt, right? When he cried out, it is finished. You know, the Greek word that, that, uh, that he cried out was to tell us die. It is finished. It's what stamped on your mortgage or your car lease or whatever it is that says paid in full. And I don't know about you, but whenever I can see that in my life, I'm pretty excited. That's a big deal. But what about the mortgage of your life? You're going to continue to make payments that will never be enough. You'll never be paid in full. And there stands Jesus just ready, willing, and more than able to stamp paid in full on that mortgage. And all he's waiting for you is just to invite him. Yes, yes, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I can't pay this debt myself. I recognize you as the son of God that you died on the cross for my sins and I recognize that you are offering to me salvation. I accept it. It's not that different than finding out that you have a hundred billion dollars in the bank in your name just waiting to be used. If you don't believe it, it's no good to you. If you're not willing To walk into the bank lobby and make a withdrawal, it's just as equally not worth anything to you. But it's when you finally say, I will, I do, I believe, I accept, I repent, I trust that Jesus delights to come in and wrap his arms around you and say, welcome home, son, or welcome home, daughter. That's why the resurrection is so critical, friends, because it proves that all of this is true. It proves that it's enough. And it proves that that offer is still being extended even today. And as we close in prayer, I'm just going to invite you to just pray that simple prayer with me. If you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that you belong to Jesus and he belongs to you because of a transaction that you made together where you invited him to be the savior of your life, where you surrendered yourself to him, then this is the morning for it. You might not have another. And he's waiting and he's ready to make you one of his children the same way that he made me his son many, many years ago. And so many of the rest of you have shared your testimonies. It's free. It's available to all. No, there's no uh, small print. There's no, you give him your life, he gives you eternity with him. And even more than that, it's kind of this bonus where he says, oh, oh, by the way, I'll walk with you now for the rest of your existence on earth. And I'll help you when you need help. And I'll make life really difficult for you at times. So you'll learn that I'm enough and that you can trust me. And that the joy that I give is worth so much more than any joy you've ever known. If you've never prayed that prayer, I hope this morning you will. And by chance, if you're just one who doesn't believe at all, all I can say is just consider the facts. Read the accounts. Go outside of Scripture. Read the the trustworthy accounts. Understand that there were well over 500 people who physically saw Jesus. Many that touched him. Some that even stuck their fingers perhaps in the holes in Jesus' wrists or in his side. And they believed. Consider the disciples. Every one of them suffered horrible, horrible deaths. Because of what they had seen, what they knew to be true. Let me tell you something. You would never allow yourself to be crucified upside down just to keep a good story going. So much evidence. But for you, if you continue to reject and you continue to not believe, the resurrection's of no value to you. And you will understand one day that the offer that has been given to you for your whole life is no longer available. And you'll live for eternity with the consequences of that decision. So wherever you are this morning, as we close in prayer, I pray that the Spirit would encourage you to take that next step that you know you need to take. It's the one that the Spirit's talking to you about right now. Don't think of any reasons why you shouldn't. Just obey. And watch what the Lord will do in you and for you. Let's pray. Father, we in your presence, first and foremost, just say thank you. Thank you for loving us, the unlovable people, so very, very much. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering so much to prove your love for us. Thank you for making a way for us to be with you. And I thank you, Lord, that your blood, your sacrifice, your offering was enough to cover the debt that we all have. And Lord, you know there are some here this morning that they need to do business with you. And you know where they are in this kind of three-group scenario that we have proposed. Lord, would you please even now work in their hearts to encourage them to take the next step. And Lord, for those who maybe are ready to pray this prayer, I pray that they would just together with me say this, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've broken your commandments. I know that I deserve death and separation from you. But Jesus said, if I just would believe... And if I just would confess my sin, and if I just with with my mouth, I would confess that, that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. If I just would do that, he would save me. And I do that this morning. I give you my life. I surrender it to you. And I accept the gift of salvation that you offer in return. I give you all of my sin, and I take from you your righteousness. And I thank you for your willingness to make this transaction with me today. 
And I pray that it would change my life for as long as I'm here on this earth. And that you would continue to walk with me and grow me into the person that you've created me to be. Lord, I pray that you would work in all of our hearts to encourage and to bless and to make us different today when we leave than when we came. May this not just be an entertainment venue where we had a great time and now we're just on to the next great event. Lord, may this be the life-changing event that the resurrection was always intended to be. We leave that in your hands. We thank you again for making it possible. And we tell you again that we love you. Go with us as we go. Walk with us. Direct our paths. Provide for us. Protect us. And Lord, one day, we can't wait. Come and get us. So that we can hear you say, good job, son. Good job, daughter. Come on home. And we'll leave the timing of all of that in your hands. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for being here. I'm going to be up here if you would like to visit. Tell me about a prayer that you prayed or ask questions. God bless you. Have a great day. Make today meaningful for eternity here to see.